I have no mantras, I have no promises to deliver, just a way of looking at it philosophically. And I think that the way I put the presentation together is um, they are hooks or triggers for your own imagination. They're never complete. So if I've said service design and I didn't say strategic design, well, the intention is that you think about a period and what's going on. I've used people who have influenced me, who I worked alongside with, but I've also, that, that doesn't mean there aren't others who haven't done so. So uh, looking at design education and now to make the clicker work. Uh, Gregory Bateson, in his book, Mind and Nature, um, and from his chapter, I've got to get somewhere where I can see this as well, uh, talks about how do you search for a pattern? And this is what I want you to keep in mind as I go through the talk. The first one is, and it's from a chapter, the first chapter, he says, this is what every schoolboy knows. So he says, search for the pattern, what pattern connects a crab to the lobster, the orchid to the primrose, and all four of them to me, and me to you, and all six of them to the amoeba in one direction, and to the backward schizophrenic in another. And his hypothesis, he says, can be approached in words. The pattern which connects is a meta pattern. It's a pattern of patterns, and it is that meta pattern which defines the vast generalization that is indeed the pattern which connects. And so that is my thesis here today, is that we have to find the pattern which connects, not necessarily in a logical order of temporality and time or of associative thinking and this is connected to this because of certain evidences we see, but perhaps the patterns are irrational, perhaps the patterns are intuitive, perhaps the patterns are not obvious, but the patterns are there. And if we can look for them, then we can, in designing 5.0, find individual patterns that make sense for us and not one global standardized pattern which I think, I fear, may become a monster meme. So, I start with this fact that in the early part of the 20th century, the real transformation came from energy and from materials, and that remains a problem till today. That when we look at energy and we make it, make it, give it the power to transform materials, we entered into a world where mechanization and standardization was the goal, the process. We entered a period of modernity, the revolution that we know as the Industrial Revolution, and the clockwork was what we counted everything by, the metronome, the logic of clocks, modern times, as Charlie Chaplin showed in his film, the conveyor belt became the visual metaphor. Everything was quantitative because it had to be measured, and in learning, we re realized that you know, our streets, our buildings, the visual text, which was a, a result of mechanization of the printing press and the rules of typography were what we learned to use in design. Now, this is Corbusier, Chandigarh, the modern city, Indian design, Western architect, the street, the grid, the logic very, very orderly. Scandinavian furniture, birth of ergonomics, metal, changing plastic, changing the rules of how furniture could be viewed, looked at, or made. Illustrated Weekly of India, 1947, and it says it is the way, the future village. Uh, and it, you can look at this demonstration of the logic of order onto superimposed on this idealized Indian village. And of course, Helvetica, Basel, and Swiss typography. These are all part of our history, our collective history, that when we talk about design and we talk about modernity, we are talking about some basic principles that we draw from this era. We designed transportation systems, and we also designed buses. We designed railway coaches, we built factories. And then when we had Education 1.0, it was clear, it was defined, 
It focused on manufacturing, communication, and infrastructure. And in the curriculum of design, we had industrial design, products, craft, textiles, all of which were there, graphic design, spatial design into our cities, and transportation design. Now when we go on, suddenly in 1976, a new world order emerged, and nobody says it better than John Paul Leotard when he says miniaturization and commercialization of machines will change the way in which learning is acquired, classified, and made available and exploited. And we enter the land of bits and bytes and zeros and ones and digitization and automation, miniaturization, things got smaller and smaller. But we're also in a very important period. And for India, this was a really important period because postmodernity and the information and communication revolution kind of became a really built us a new world order. And why? Because we had, post, for the first time, we had the narrative of globalization, but we also had very strong post-colonial narratives, deconstruction of our colonial legacy, and beginning to look at the world through quant qualitative and not quantitative eyes. And we had new media, we had sensory and locative and audible devices, we looked at the tactile, we looked at the local, and we also looked at the handcrafted. And I think this is a very important point I want to make, that in India, really in this time, there were two Indias. You know, on one hand, we were better positioned than most other countries because our in the legacy of industrialization, our focus on high science and technology, allowed us to embrace the digital revolution with a source of human capabilities that rode it to unimaginable heights. Uh, it's what gave Rajiv the ability to go off to Austin, right? It's, it's what we did. Our IITs did that. We became a key provider of services in this economy. But then on the other side, there were smaller narratives. Narratives attributed to Gandhi, narratives attributed to Tagore, Gandhi, you know, where the vernacular, the use of local materials was very, very important, and this was a very powerful force in defining the shape and contours of design education. And this is something that NID led from the front. So if IIT, IDC took the first part, I think NID worked on the second part. And then we have architecture. And architecture here is Laurie Baker. You have modern India there with one side of planning and building. And then you have Laurie Baker who came in and said, no, I want to think more you know, organically. I want to make my own bricks. I want to use different forms. I want to think of ventilation. And he is somebody whom we figure was one of the first minimalists of Indian architecture, where he started looking at local ecology and surroundings and mapping them and constructing dwellings. He made a commitment to mass affordable housing and influenced huge communities across India. So these two narratives, the IIT, IDC, and the Gandhian um, alternative narrative of post-colonialism clashed in India, giving us a sense of a new vocabulary of design. I have not been exhaustive here, but Bollywood is, an, is, is also a narrative of our times. When we suddenly rode up with the media value chain, just doing exactly what we wanted, breaking every rule in the book as to what was entertainment. And, we, and it is a, a medium that is now ruling the world. Tagore. The second counter narrative coming from Shanti Niketan, where he said, Why are we looking at Basel and Swiss typography? Why aren't we looking at our own cultural aesthetic expressions and our own forms? And this is uh, Swati Ghosh's book on the design movement in Tagore, Shanti Niketan. Suddenly, the whole language of expression, of communication, was beginning in our educational systems to have new voices new gods, if you like, new sources of inspiration. But then, here is Bill. And, you know, when I met him, that was a picture actually, sadly, just after he died. 
this book space place and the infoban is really something that affected me very deeply because suddenly he brought the bits and bytes right back into our backyard and said you know we are designing cities with bits and bytes you can't leave that factor out and then there was this notion that we could do things simultaneously we had a database we had a history and things like telematic art performances began to come into the vocabulary this is a stock image from the internet it is not something that happened at shrishti but we worked a lot at telematic art at that time so we embraced technology from different sides the power of its simultaneity and india delivered its own digital india image you know the goal that you talked about in here it yeah we are the government of india at the turn of the century looking at digital empowerment of citizens e governance you did infrastructure to everybody electronic manufacturing broadband highways all of which have come to pass you know if so so many of these things are things that have happened so what does it mean for education 2.0 we still have and have industrial design communication spatial and transportation design but this added newer features telematic arts information design design for the other 90% was india's goal service design strategic design so many other things but the basic fundamental process is where there was some sort of a flaw because we were looking at linear defined processes to actually engage with people when the technology and the computational networks were non linear and our pro curriculum went from 101 102 when actually there had to be more recursive and different forms of repetition so here's my first kind of made up meta pattern you know i'm just trying to keep this vocabulary going so that you don't think i'm just doing a chronology of indian thing but i want you to think so what would be the pattern that could connect the logic of standardization ergonomics with typography with the simultaneous emergent practice of telematic art and how does this perception in turn connect with the creation of digital services for the other 90% now if we were to search for a pattern that connects maybe the word would be maybe this is just my throw out word is ethical expertise i don't know maybe you would give it something else it's emergent from posing the question with the question itself is yours or mine but if we search for the pattern that connects seemingly unconnected things then we start coming up with a value proposition with which we can look at design for the future when we finished this whole information era which we are still in as we are in the industrial era the whole amount of turbulence came from non linearity the return of non euclidean uh, thinking quantum mechanics understanding complexity and chaotic systems network economics and post digitization we are trying to escape flatland and we entered the world of different kinds of capital e money ideas locative things that were disruptive looking for holes but this was also the first time when different things like closed loop manufacturing started coming into the vocabulary of design education and nobody says it better than kevin kelly and i've just taken a few points from his work where he started talking and this is really about 2000 is this notion of neo biological civilization you know we're talking about it today but kevin kevin kelly to put it out he said we don't have the logic of the clockwork anymore don't look at the clock don't look at the metronome look at flocks termites look at the collective intelligence of the mob look at decentralizing remembering as an act of perception and looking at closed loop manufacturing which we're all going to talk about over the next two days as circular economies and suddenly you find that this kind of breakaway non euclidean thinking had a huge impact on society we know that we know that there is a collective intelligence of the mob the whole rise of social media the whole rise of how digital worlds planned a post digital future here perspective is not the vanishing point anymore when we are designing for the future we really everybody is a cubist because you're decentering memory 
and perception. You are the mob, is the tribal. We know that today with Twitter. We know that with social WhatsApp. We know that with the way our politics of various countries across the world are being managed, perhaps by tribals rather than by professionals. We know that today, in a post-digital world, we need to create capacities for multiple understandings, not a single understanding. And suddenly, you can look at the old world differently, too. You know, instead of Corbusier's Chandigarh, you can compare it to the ancient planning of the city of Banaras, where there was a cosmic, non-Euclidean scale, which is on the right side, and on the left-hand side were different patterns of the city. Fractals, self-similar, organized with organic metaphors of the trident and the conch. Things that we didn't value in our discourse when we entered modernity, when we planned Chandigarh. And our cities, I mean, you know, I'm amazed at Hyderabad. I haven't been here for years, and I come here and I see Cyber City. And I think that there, are, there is a need sometimes to be non-Euclidean and go back and, and really look at many of these issues again. Uh, this is a more traditional way in which Varanasi is being looked at, which is with the relation to the river and the floods. And so in, these, in a post-digital time or period, when we know that technology processes are being organized around self-organizing aut autonomous agents, when we know that we have behaviors which are about following, like flocks or termites, we now know that we're looking at intellectual property and startups and mobility and smart cities in our, as our drivers in India. And our curriculum now has expanded to include experience design, interaction design, IoT, and ideas about usability. And I would, under, I would say that perhaps what Rajiv was saying in your last point is really is the usability for the other 90% who are not able to think and live in a pervasive world of pervasive uh, microcomputers and microchips and microcomputing. Now, where do we go next? We think of another meta pattern. And we say, well, what connects Laurie Baker's ideas of Gandhian architecture to the ancient design of old cities, and perhaps what can that connect with that old plan of an old city connect with the reality of climate change? And when we start posing these kind of questions, we start looking at ideas perhaps of values of making and not of taking. And that goes to the center, because earlier, if you see, I've looked at intellectual property. And intellectual property is all about taking. If you go back two or three slides here, I'm talking about ideas, you know, locative capital. We put a GI, you know, geographical indicators on, you know, the Pochampali. But that is all about extracting. It's all about taking away. But the minute you start posing a question that is slightly different, then you say perhaps the future is about putting the value of making at the center and then maybe we can look at climate change, looking at the old cities patterns and Laurie Baker, and try and see how we can actually think of teaching people how to design. Now, while we are engaged with these dialogues on Euclidean and non-Euclidean spaces, the physics of fractals, and post-digitization and fuzzy disruptive innovation, we are now entering a world where neuroscience plays a huge role. And that was really very big part of the future of learning work that I contributed to the research studies at Harvard, where there were only three pathways, globalization, digital technologies, mind-body. And really, the mind-body is something that is at the foreground of our thinking today, of neuroscience, of biological systems. We're now living in a post-information area, and we need now to find out what genetic engineering or permeability or play means. And just as a bit of a sound bite, I have my colleague, uh, Sai Krishna Morupali, who's got a poster out, say, of current work in this area called Museums of the Mind, 
which is in partnership with NIMHANS, the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurological Sciences, where we're just trying to understand what this means in design terms and design education terms. What is the connectivity? What is the plasticity? So why, what do you mean by play? You know, you don't, you don't necessarily have to play to design a product. Here, uh, artists and design students are working at Shrishti. This is a, presented at Serendipity in Goa a few years ago. They, took, they worked with satellites, they built their own satellite, they collected data and sound and installations and they played with it and this is an installation. And through play and learning with these technologies, one is really coming up with the new ideas. This is uh, also work that Sai has contributed to and my late colleague, sadly we lost him, Abhyan Humane. Uh, this is an exhibit where a student is just trying to concentrate. The red dot, you know, and there's a sensor, you know, a little headband with a little sensor. And the more the person underneath the umbrella concentrates, the more it rains. Right? And the minute you get distracted, the rain stops. And so the idea is you've got hundreds of people going in trying to make it rain, but we're really looking at this notion of the mind, con neurons, concentration, impact on sensors, sensor-based technologies, and the physical manifestation of it as rain. All, all still permeable, porous kind of extra. This is at the Carbon Park metro station, where people who are, we're looking at migratory cultures here, and here are people who are riding in the train, uh, have sensors, voice activators, and then the, their, their voices and their things are coming up on this big screen, which is like a conveyor belt next to, they hadn't put in the escalator, so we kind of built the screen on what is now an escalator. This was an experiment with, funded by USAID with two computer scientists from the United States who came down, and again, this is what I'm saying. We're living in a post-digital, post-information world. Everybody thinks your mobile phone data is secure. Everybody who came in through that put, gave their mobile phone private, w w walked through an installation. The map on the ground through light shows where their data is in, on parts of the world. Nobody's privacy was secure. And this is the kind of interaction, you know, I'm not really saying the word intercourse. I'm just saying that it is really about engaging embodied learning that makes people understand what the future could be, the imagination and play that's necessary. Again, uh, we use the metro station a lot because they've got lots of space, is about immersive poetry and a festival of stories. Everybody could tell stories, everybody could act, and it was everywhere coming in a, in a hugely disjointed kind of manner. So where we are, we are now in the post-digital world, and we are now looking at big data, we're looking at analytics and AI, we're looking at bots, we're looking at moist materials, we're looking at climate change, we're looking at advanced precision manufacturing, we're looking at IoT still. And, but we really now, and the role of today, I think, maybe, is to also look at the difference between the real and the artificial. What do we actually mean when we are designing molecular machines? Because we're actually using substance which is living when we're doing that. We're not just mimicking them. What does the post-human period or condition have? Synthetic biology is when we monkey around with genes. And what are we actually learning? Well, here are some of our students who are working on designing an intelligent, genetically engineered machine. They're art and design students, and they're searching for some DNA. They were taking part in an international competition uh, with MIT. And they actually won three times, three successive years, because they were not, they didn't have the dogma of high science and technology. They were fearless, like you said. They were able to take risks, and they designed amazing number of new living organisms, new DNA, new characteristics in an art studio. Here, we, here this too was something that was done a few months ago, uh, where you are talking about robots and you're talking about programming and you're talking about algorithms, but here they taught a computer how to make music so that you could actually not, they were not 
composing on the computer, but they were teaching the computer how to actually use and just do computational sound. And that's what was happening. So what then becomes the meta pattern, we could ask. So we could say, we, and these are all just hypothetical questions I rustled up in the early hours of this morning, so they're not sort of with the intent except to provoke, is what connects the classical Swiss approach to the telematic arts and what con connects the simultaneity of telematic arts to synthetic biology, and really what connects that is ethics. Ethics and value, and this is the book by Varela, Ethics and of Wisdom, Know What and Know How. I'm not going to it because I don't have time. You can get a copy of it. But Varela talks extensively about value and about ethics and about intentionality and about the mind-brain and about the biology of cognition. And we, these are questions we need to ask ourselves as we come to 5.0. And in the time of 5.0, the learning really is in a field of consciousness because that's the post-human condition and poesis, which is the Greek word for creativity. And so, when, when you look at it, I've taken this from uh, the post-human post manifest, the future never comes. In a post-human era, machines will no longer be machines, says Robert Pepperell. And consciousness, which is the mind, and the environment, which is our lived reality, cannot be separated. So it doesn't matter if you're bioengineered, if you have a prosthesis, or if part of your valve or something else is from somewhere else, they are still part of your body, and they are, therefore your mind cannot be replaced in a way by the physicalness of an artificial device. And the consciousness is an emergent property, and it emerges from given sets of conditions. So that's the challenge in learning, and then the challenge of our education is that we have to define those given set of conditions for consciousness to emerge. Mm -hmm.